before the date before school starts, at least at Hopkins, right? <laughs> so the eve of the eve of the first day of school. Um, August 26th, Hadley School Committee meeting. Is there a motion to call the meeting to order? So moved. Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any adjustments to the agenda tonight? Uh, no, I do not believe that there are. All right. And we'll dive right in. We have a number of um, presentations and discussion items. We will start with the Hadley Elementary School Student Handbook. And that was sent to us previously in a separate email. Mm -hmm. Jeff? So there uh, were only one major change I, I wanted to highlight, and that would be, I believe, on page eight um, in the summary. <coughs> and that had to do around our dismissal. So what currently had happened, well, last year, not currently, but uh, last year when I first started my work, um, I noticed that the dismissal procedure was a little, needed some work. Um, what had happened in years prior were that the students, when they were a parent pickup, would be walked outside the building and then handed off to an adult that was waiting. Um, the breakdown, I think, that needed to have some addressing was that there weren't always consistent adults walking the children out. So if we had a, a teacher that was out, we would have a substitute or we would have somebody who wasn't very familiar with the families. And so it caused some concern, and some of the teachers had also felt that it was not the best practice um, when you're considering safety, and especially for our youngest students. So we decided to just kind of try something different. We invited families to come in after the children left, the, after the um, bus children left. And um, so parents were invited in. There were two separate locations. The youngest students were in one classroom in the library, and the older students were in the art room, and parents came in. They had a visual with their teacher. They signed them out, so there was some accountability as to who was actually picking up um, the students. And then they would exit the building. Um, the overall feedback has been really positive, that this was a step in the right direction as far as student safety. Um, we had some non-custodial parent issues throughout the school year, and so instead of just really trying to track down who was being outside, we could invite people in, get accountability, check IDs if we didn't know who they were, um, and then release them. So overall, it was really positive, so that was really the only update into the student handbook on page 8 um, that I highlighted in my summary. That's great. Um, there was one additional change in the track changes um, mm -hmm. around the medication. Yes. Um, and I, I've read this a few times um, just to see if it's my brain, but I think that that track change didn't actually change it. Yes, I noticed that as well. But, <laughs> um, and I really, I think I can credit my amazing um, uh, assistant, uh, Corey Feltovic, for that because we would get changes throughout the year to our handbook policy and she would go in and make those corrections. So I started with the track changes and then I said, oh, this sounds very familiar. Um, so even though it was a listed um, recommendation by um, Renee, who was our, our um, health, health coordinator, it really came from her. Um, but I noticed too that when I was going in to make some of those changes, they had already been updated to the handbook. Looking at actually um, her notes, mm -hmm. Um, well, of course, I forgot my glasses in my car. Um, it looks like on her note. Um, 18. 18. Thanks. Oh, okay, wait. Proposed. There it is. Yes. Never mind. Yes. Yeah. Her note was proposed to change from four to three, not the other way around. So yeah. Correct. Awesome. Go for it. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> And as policies change, you know, especially when they're health related, we always want to make sure that we're up to date and that we're implementing them because families do access um, this handbook. And so we want to make sure that as changes come in, that we're thoughtful about not just waiting till the last minute, but making sure that we're up to date. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Great. Do you have any questions about the dismissal in particular? I've always found it funny that we have had in the policy, there's a white line, you stay on the other side. It just sends such a signal of like, this is our space, this is your space, stay out. And I, uh, 
it, this makes so much more sense from a safety perspective, but also from a interact with your community perspective. Well, I wanted families to be able to come in and feel like this is their school right. and that their children are being cared for and they're safe. And so inviting them in and not having them wait behind the white line, which I too found was a little off-putting um, for families. There were two other families that reached out to me and said that the new policy was difficult for them um, because they have so many other children that they would have in the car and that would require them on snowy days to bring them into the building. So there were only two families that reached out to me and um, I've accommodated them by bringing the children to them so they don't have to leave. And I'm the point person for that and I encourage all families when I sent this new policy out um, to call me and, and invite me in their conversation of how this is going to work for their family. We have such small numbers that we really are able to do that if they, if they find it to be hardship. So. Thank you for doing that. Yeah. All right, any other questions or comments on the handbook? Okay, this is an action item. So uh, is there a motion to approve the Hadley Elementary School uh, handbook as noted? So moved. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Well, okay, we'll move to the Hopkins <coughs> Academy student handbook. So we have three yeah. changes. <clears throat> uh, proposed one is um, the same as Jen's, which has already been approved for their handbook as it uh, came from the district. And so we just need to incorporate that district language for <clears throat> the change to the health policy in the Hopkins Academy handbook as well. And then <clears throat> we have two, what I would characterize as being substantive changes because we're focusing these on our communication and interactions with students. And this is directly related to data that we have gathered over the last couple of years, as well as observations. So the first one comes from data, uh, is related to a significant increase. As I sent out emails last year to families, and the school committee probably also received one of those emails if you didn't, if you didn't have a child at Hopkins. Um, just about the significant number of students, we had 24 students by mid-year, 24% of our students by mid-year who had exceeded um, the acceptable rate of, um, for punctuality. So the, almost a quarter of the, the entire student body um, had six tardies or more with um, a good portion of those upper level students, juniors and seniors in particular, those who drove to school, um, who had more than 10 tardies in a semester. And our policy as far as, tardy, as, as, far as punctuality for a one-town school district is extremely liberal and forgiving. To get five before you incur any sanctions is, is um, very reasonable. Um, <clears throat> and allows students to be able to account and families for things that might come up you know, without having to make excuses and so forth. So um, while that part has worked, we needed to find some levers uh, available, some incentives, some disincentives. And so one of the things that we took a look at was we feeling like the senior privileges policy was outdated. Um, what senior privileges basically focused on as a criteria for qualification was no courses, no, no grades in a marking period of below uh, C minus in any of your content areas, which is reasonable and we stuck with that. <clears throat> and then there were some references to having done some things to your, for your graduating classes. And it turned out that was difficult to track because class advisors could change from year to year and there was no system to track that participation on the part of students, so we were simply trusting them. That in and of itself provided an opportunity um, for April Camuso, the head teacher, met with the department chairs, and they put together policy recommendations that they then brought to the student council and reviewed them with the entire student, the leadership of the student council, and I believe with the entire student council, got feedback, integrated those into the proposal that we have here. And so basically, it adds thresholds in a quarter of a school year for um, acceptable punctuality and acceptable attendance to school. So if you want to get senior privileges, you have to show up to school, and you have to show up to school on time on a consistent basis. So it doesn't create something that's unreasonable, but it hopefully will help us to be able to target those places where um, students you know, value their senior privileges, that they will hopefully be incentivized to, or disincentivized to follow, uh, follow through with what's expected of them in terms of attendance and punctuality to school. <clears throat> the second change, um, is in our cell phone policy and trying to provide clarity of enforcement. 
really the enforcement that we had in the previous policy was light uh, and left itself open to any one of us as members of the staff being inconsistent in its enforcement. There were areas where it was very tight and then there were areas where it could be very loose and it could often vary from individual to individual in the building. So we wanted to take those policy, to take those procedures and wrap it into policy so that it's codified so that everybody's on the same page. And we have a model and there's basically two different levels that the department chairs and the student services team weighed in on uh, wanting to make sure that cell phones were not allowed in the middle school during the school day. And the basic reason be reasoning behind that came from research that was done by Ms. Monier, who's the chair of that committee, or the chair of that uh, student services team. They had done some research that indicates that um, those are students who are less like, least likely to have the skills of navigating their way around the electronic communications in social circumstances. And certainly we saw uh, handfuls of students dealing with social issues during the day that were a complete distraction really to the entire school and tapped our resources. Whereas if they didn't have that means of being able to communicate, um, those circumstances would be stopped or mitigated. So that, that was one reason for continuing uh, clarity, really clarifying something that should have been the practice all along, which is that middle school students shut off their cell phones at 7.30 when they enter class and they can turn them back on at 2 o'clock. They need to be in their backpacks <clears throat> or in a place that's provided by the teacher or securing their locker. For high school students, we have in the past opened up use, although um, we were clear about the types of use in the classroom really needed to be in control of the teacher. What we have seen in our observation is that there, it, it has presented a substantial substra uh, distraction as a result of the inconsistencies of enforcement that are not due to any particular individual, but more to the lack of clarity in the policy. So we clarified the policy because we, the model that we have is when students do their MCAS tests. Our students are great at every grade level and they're all familiar with it. You get prompted <clears throat> at the beginning of class, all right, everybody put your cell phones away, you shut them off. Students put them in their backpacks or they put them in uh, a place provided by the teacher or a charging station with the cell phones off <clears throat> and no access to them while class is in session. So high school students can turn their cell phones back on in passing time, can check their texts and so forth. Um, same during the high school break and same during high school lunch. And we figured that was a reasonable um, place to meet them in between. We didn't feel compelled to have a ban for the entire day. Um, and if approved, I'll be sending out a communication and working with parents over the course of the year to, for all of us to sort of help model um, really effective, effective use of screen time and uh, you know make sure that we're doing it in places where um, other things are not a priority and we're not taking away or providing distractions with a, a policy that's too loose. Any questions? I just had one question on the cell phone one. Um, so from the original policy where, the current policy I should say, were under all subsequent offenses, that you uh, talked about removal of phone privileges in the current policy and then excessive violations may result in you being prevented from even having the device in school. Now the new proposed one is that um, all subsequent, so after the second offense, it says removal of cell phone privileges for one quarter. So what's, what's the difference between, if you don't have cell phone privileges for a quarter, are you still allowed to have a device with you? Uh, in the building, if you're... No, if, if a student has, if they have a cell phone with them, and we've managed this effectively already because mm -hmm. we've, we've removed privileges from students, and we do have an understanding that students have, they need to communicate after school. So a student who has their cell phone privileges removed, a parent either has to confirm with us that they've kept the cell phone at home, and then, you know, there's only an issue if we see this, the, the phone in the student, then we know that we're not able to trust the student. And, and we haven't been in that situation at all. If a student needs to have it with them because they have to do communication after school, which many students might have to do outside of the times that the office are open because they're involved in extracurricular activities. Yeah. So if we, a student who incurs a cell phone suspension for any period of time, they turn it into the office and we put it in the safe and they can come back down and pick it up at the end of the day. They okay. just can't have it on them during the school day at all. Got it. <clears throat> That makes sense. Thank and they, those have been very few and far between, and yep. it really it's been second offense. We've taken it away for a week, and that's typically been um, middle school yep. students who are kind of pushing at it, and by the time we get up to the high school, high school students are, are pretty mature, but they've also had a looser policy. We had to put sanctions in place. You know, they're, they're acquainted with the concept in, in MCAS that 
if they take out their cell phone when they go to the bathroom, their test is invalidated. Right. And so all of our teachers also know that language because we do that training every year. So it's not something that's unfamiliar to anybody in terms of the protocol to follow. And I think it's perfectly reasonable for both student and parents to, and, and teachers to understand that you can go without looking at your cell phone for 84 minutes at a pump. Yeah. So. No, that makes sense. Thank you. I do have a question about uh, the um, senior privileges. Uh, so senior privileges only apply to seniors, and are you saying juniors don't have a tardy, as much of a tardy issue as the seniors? They don't, but it, it does, be, that's, that's the other point at which it begins to creep in because those students begin to drive to school. But it's not exclusive to students who drive. It's that in, in the classes, graduate or grade levels, seven through 10, the overwhelming majority of students who live in town take the bus. And so they're making it to school on time by virtue of the fact that they're taking the bus. Um, so their junior year attendance and um, punctuality will be the uh, criteria upon which they earn senior privileges. So it's not as though they're not going to be held accountable at that time. It's if they want senior privileges, they have to look ahead. And they have to adhere to that policy. And that's part of that point of emphasis too with juniors, that if you want this to start off your senior year, you need to have you need to be punctual and you need to have good attendance. If, if in either semester um, a junior exceeds the attendance limit or the punctuality limit, um, then they're not going to have senior privileges for the first quarter of their senior year. It almost works like athletic eligibility. Exactly. All sports. Yep. Any other questions on the handbook? No, I think these seem like good changes that um, clarify and um, have been adapted to kind of where we are now. So, yeah, it's appreciated. Uh, so, we have an action item on this to uh, approve the. Hopkins Academy Handbook, is there a motion? <coughs> motion. What she said. Second. Second. <laughs> All in favor? <laughs> Aye. Aye. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so Thank you much. All. All right. Thanks, guys. Thank you. District Strategy and Superintendent Goals. Annie. Yes. So in your packet, I'm hoping that the strategy captures uh, several of the things that we discussed at our meeting at the beginning of August. So we talked about under that I made minimal changes. I, I don't think that our purpose or our vision has changed. Um, it, under expectation, I did add that terminology about deep learning that we had talked about, which is a priority for the Executive Office of Education, and a priority I agree with. It's not just about complying with an expectation. The idea that learning should be interactive, relevant, relational. I, I included some of this in my opening remarks today. Teachers were very enthusiastic. Um, I specifically laid out the, the goal of establishing an early college high school pathway, an innovation pathway, and Chapter 74 approved program or programs at Hopkins Academy. And I'll just, um, just restate why this is, I think, so critical, particularly for Hopkins. So I think all students, we owe all students rigorous, challenging, engaging, and interesting coursework. And the new teacher project, TNTP, has a research study out called The Opportunity Myth that talks about how many high school students, when surveyed nationwide, discuss the, talk about the fact that coursework is just not as challenging as they could take or as engaging as they would like. And that the students who are hit the hardest by the lack of engagement and lack of rigor are students who are most at risk to either not graduate or are the least likely to pursue post-secondary opportunities after graduation. Our Executive Office of Education has also stated that within about a 10-year time frame, they would like to see 50% of all high school students enrolled in either an innovation pathway, an early college pathway, or a Chapter 74 approved program. So it is critical that we get ahead of this, that we design these opportunities in advance of that expectation. Because if you think about, if you look at what the New England School Development Council is predicting for our enrollment based on declining birth rates and other things. If you took our Hopkins 9 through 12 student body, 
drop that by 25% and cut it in half, you'd be down to about 55 students, which would not be a sustainable place. So our goal is that we have these opportunities ready and thriving and available to our students. Our faculty was very excited as we were talking about these today, and we've already gotten great indications from the state that we're well positioned to do this work. So I think I, I shared with you that we submitted for a planning grant to plan to innovation pathways. We received that planning grant. We'll submit part A of that application. Those pathways are in business finance and life science and environmental sciences. Um, I heard from, I put together a draft grant proposal for early college uh, pathway. In the early college pathway, the vision uh, that, that I have and, and others have is that the state executive office says they would like to see in early college models that every student is able to earn a minimum of 12 college credits but while they are still in high school. And uh, the Greenfield president and I have spoken and our goal would be that within five years, it's an ambitious goal, but we both think it's a worthwhile goal, that students who graduate from Hopkins Academy would have the opportunity to earn a minimum of 12 college credits and up to what's called a wall-to-wall -wall program in which they could potentially graduate with a high school diploma and an associate's degree at the same time and that this would be offered free of charge. Um, so that's early college. On chapter 74, we're starting our public safety courses this year and fire science courses. These courses may in the future also link up to an early college pathway. Greenfield Community College offers an associate's in fire science technology. But uh, I've reached out to the, our, our Department of Elementary and Secondary Education about, they have chapter 74, there's a chapter 74 approved program for criminal justice, and I'm interested to see what options exist within public safety as a whole, and um, hopefully, or the goal is that we would get on the path of creating our own chapter 74 approved program here. And I was thinking today as I walked over to, uh, was walking around Hadley Elementary, I said, oh yeah, Hadley Kids is our program now. Who's to say that we couldn't have a Chapter 74 program in early education and care, which is already a cha approved Chapter 74 pathway. Right. Um, so that, uh, the, the other things that are on here, I think um, there's reference to in this and in the plan and in my goals, start time there, it, the start time task force, several other things we talked about, but I wanted to restate for all of you and for people in the public who may watch this, some of these very exciting opportunities that we are putting in place now for our students at Hopkins Academy. So we're excited. Oh, and school redesign. Well, that is another agenda item. Never yeah. mind. So there you have it. There is a draft of, as I say, the document. I, I have that five-year window because I said mm -hmm. to you I really have that early college goal inside of five years. Um, but it would be reviewed annually. And then as we talked about, under my goals, we talked about the fact that those that really it's about process and implementation. Because a lot of those activities, I didn't say X percentage of students will have participated each year. Those quantitative metrics will 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 add those. We'll say, all right, we have the pathway up and running. We have to get it now. How many students and what um, what demographic representation do we want to ensure in these pathways and early college and then we'll integrate quantitative metrics. I'm open to your feedback. It's really for you to approve and guide. On the goals, I was, on the superintendent goals, I was just going to mention, yeah. um, I, th I think you want to update the year references. Yeah, that would right? be helpful. But sure. other than that, because um, <laughs> I would already have failed. <laughs> so that's the year. That I thought it, it reflected, you know, a lot of our discussion that we had during our retreat and um, are in line with the district strategy and vision. Yeah, These are exciting um, changes. Yeah. yeah, they just create so many more pathways and opportunities for our Hopkins students. Yeah. Great. So this is not an action item, but any other? And, and that's my mistake. It should have been. So sorry. Okay. Well, then we will add yeah. it. Yes. Thank you. You do have to approve my goals every year and the strategy. Is there a motion to approve the district strategy and superintendent goals? So moved. Second. Second. All in 
favor. Aye. Okay. All right. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now school redesign opportunities. Yes. So uh, also, so as we're thinking about what are these path, what does middle and secondary need to look like, and all the way down, you know, how do we integrate more uh, technology, engineering, arts? I mean, how do we ensure that the elementary that learning is interactive, relational, and relevant? Um, there are we have the opportunity to participate in two exciting things. One is called the School Redesign Institute that convenes in Framingham, Massachusetts, where a team of um, a parent, a student, uh, and I was going to uh, recommend, suggest that Mr. Kelly, Jack Kelly, uh, get the right of first refusal on being the student since he uh, very enthusiastically participates in these meetings and some, it, one deserves a reward for that. I mean, let's hope <laughs> as a parent, a student, uh, myself, the high school principal, and a couple of high school teachers. So they want teams around five, it's, it's, it's roughly uh, six folks. We go out to Framingham with the problem of practice, and our problem of practice, what we've been talking about, is how do we ensure that learning in, at the secondary level is relevant? How do we make sure that students are engaged because they're learning things that they see a clear connection between what they're learning and careers that they'll pursue, their personal interests, and post-secondary opportunities? So that's one uh, opportunity, and a second opportunity is then, which I submitted this application over the weekend, um, is to for uh, a smaller team, slightly smaller team, <coughs> to go on what are called learning excursions. Uh, the Bar Foundation funds these opportunities, and then the team is sent to schools in different regions of the country to see models of relevant learning in action, personalization, high schools that have engaged in redesign. I sent you something earlier today from Fred, because these opportunities don't pay, but they provide stipends to cover travel costs. Um, that I was the parent that came to mind, because there's a, a dual role here, a parent that came to mind right away was Humera, um, because of some of the work that you've done at MIT uh, in your own professional life and how this is something that actually, if you recall when we were over, when we had our retreat at the Mistake Place, where I posted it in the <laughs> place, we had nothing, we had water, the farms, and covered yeah. furniture, yeah, you know, that retreat. Um, and actually, Humara had said, have we ever thought about going out and visiting other schools mm -hmm. when we think about this? Mm -hmm. So I did want to get from the attorney clarification of if stipends are provided, can school committee do these kinds of things? It won't be the only opportunity and what are the restrictions and requirements. And there are no restrictions, it just the, the instructions are pretty clear that they sent out. Disclosures, which I too, administrators would have to do. Mr. Beck would have to do as well. Um, and so I wanted to, to bring that to your attention and um, see if you had any thoughts or feedback on it. Sounds exciting. Yeah, it does. I'm especially excited about it. It's right up my alley. And I'm Honored to be able to serve. Yeah, I am. I am very excited too. And I think even as we have some discussions that we have major capital projects that we're looking at for next year and renovations. But as we've talked about, if there is a discussion or an appetite for saying, well, really, what do we want in terms of facilities for learning? I think it's you can make a much more compelling case to your community and to the MSBA if you're clear about what's happening inside of the building, because that's so much more important than the building itself. So that yeah. this will help us get very clear on that. What we want. Mm -hmm. And what's the timing of those um, two forms? So the Redesign Institute is November, I believe it's November 2nd and 3rd. I feel like it's a Friday and a Saturday in November. Mm -hmm. I have to submit that application um, and they just emailed today, me today to remind me that they, they were looking for our application. It's not due until the 13th of September. And then the learning excursions, it depends on where they decide to send you. That's the date. So there's one in December, one in March, and I think there's one in February. And they decide where you go. It'll be interesting as that all comes together as to kind of the curriculum's the wrong word, but kind of the, the approach, the agenda, the, the framing of how, how 
this all comes about, when kind of what their goals are and out, you know, outcomes that they're looking to achieve. Yeah. Yeah. I think your idea too of um, giving uh, Jack Kelly the first right of refusal is a good one. I think he seems, you know, yeah, he may be very interested in doing this. It's, a, it's the least I can do because he shows up here enthusiastic and ready. So that's worth a lot to us. Um, yeah. I'm glad you can be a part of it too. It's great. Yeah, it feels like, I mean, dare I say, it feels like it's really all coming together. So thanks thanks for hanging on to me for six years. Me and I am in my stride now. It's really feeling like it's coming together. All right. Anything else on school redesign mm -hmm. opportunities? Okay. Um, topic E Title I Program Evaluation. So. I will just point out some highlights for you. This evaluation you get annually, right? So the beginning, the explanation is pretty, it doesn't change from year to year except for the date, unless if our policy changed around uh, criteria for selection, we would do that. The, the second page is, I think, important. Um, so just so you know, the district, not every year we are expected to evaluate our program and then Oh, being like every three or six years, actually it's probably every six years, the state the state can conduct a random audit at any time and then they do a more in-depth audit. So it's important for school committee to know that we should be, and we are, doing this every year whether the state asks for it or not. We have program evaluations. I have all the ones that, that we've written. And um, I'll start also adding Title III program evaluations for you. And they make sure that we're in compliance. So we do a self-evaluation whether the state comes or not. We have, as we do every year, we have some great news in uh, data that starts on page three. Student identifying information is removed. If you were looking at any of the letters and thinking that, oh, if it's A on this page, is student A on the second page? It's not. I just go down, I just take out names and put letters. So there's not, there's no correspondence between different sets of data on each page. Um, so great news, if you look at that grade one, these are students who receive Title I services. I mean, that is incredible, right? Um, so when you see a growth percentile, right, through, it was at the top of the percentile, right? So um, aggressive growth. Even where I've highlighted a student who had flat growth, it's important to note that that student did meet benchmarks. So the student did, did not have a lot of room to grow. The student met their benchmarks, that's the thing about growth, if you're closer to benchmarks, you're not going to have a lot of growth. Um, but we're really excited by what we're seeing in the early grades. This was the point of implementing a tiered system of support. Intervene early. Be clear about what a child needs. Intervene early. Progress monitor results so that they are well positioned to be academically successful later. And we're not playing catch up. And more importantly, they're not playing catch up because it's a miserable way to be in school. Um, and you see on uh, page four that in the gates changes. Um, so it tells you a difference of 11 points is for individual students that is significant um, growth. So we had a lot of students who um, maybe didn't hit that significant growth marker, but still they had growth. Those yellow highlights that you see, this is a time test. The student wasn't finished. That's what the yellow highlight is telling you. So they may have known much more, but we're required to do this as a time test for this particular test, and they ran out of time. And uh, just, last, yeah, just a question on that page. Um, is there any, uh, like in looking at grade six mm -hmm. as compared to the other grades, yep. there's fewer in the green changes, yep. obviously. Is that um, an attribute of having achieved goals previously, or is there any kind of? No, it wouldn't be that. However, because um, these are just changes, this isn't growth that you're yep. looking at. Okay. But, and, and I'm just going to throw out a possible hypothesis, but there's certainly not enough. Like, I can't say definitively, this is, this is what's happening. Mm -hmm. I will be curious to see these students in the upper grades as we progress. Because remember, we started tiered systems of support in first grade. It was the first grade that we started. Yeah. This year, we're moving it into grade six. Right? So last year it was not in grade six. So we're expanding up, so it'll be all the way through K through six. So I'm wondering if over time we start to see that in, in yeah, these things working complementary okay. with each other. Thanks.
And uh, lastly, changes in uh, DRA levels. And um, this, you know, what you see in some of the other tests is really just about fluency, which if you don't have fluency, reading is miserable. Right? So it isn't all about speed, but if you're not a fluent reader, that's why it's so, such the big prize in early grades. It is really laborious to read if you're stuck at sounds and words. Mm -hmm. This DRA measures comprehension. And again, I'll point out that red just means that they didn't meet the grade level benchmark, which is at the bottom. But I'm going to give you an example of a student in first grade who started at A, which is actually fall, K fall. That was the DRA score. It's comparable to, even though they're in first grade, they had a uh, DRA score that was fall of kindergarten. And they made it to winter of first grade. So they didn't meet that ultimate benchmark, but that's a year and a half's worth of growth in a single year. I have to say, Ms. DeBartolomeo continues to do amazing things. I'm not convinced she's human. She might be a princess in a uniform, I think, and a magician, all rolled into one. But uh, the students work really hard. Families show up. Families uh, use the resources that Ms. DeBartolomeo suggests. So families are key players. Students are doing hard work. But uh, she's, she's just magical. Okay. I second that. Yeah, mm -hmm. she is. Okay, so no actions on these. No, nope. thank you. All right, ELL and access data. Another magician who's moved to Colorado, uh, Ms. Tassadi and all of our students. So what you see here, and again, in, for next year, I'll have a, a Title III program evaluation just so you can see all the places to make sure we're tracking that we're in compliance with the law. Student growth percentile, so what was their growth in access? We have some really impressive growth, and in some cases, um, that first student, the change in growth from 18 to 19 is really impressive. So above 65 is considered high. This is a different test. Uh, these are the Department of Ed standards. Um, above 35 is considered moderate, 35 to 65. Uh, and uh, then below uh, 35 is considered low. Uh, so that's, and if you don't see a score from last year, so here's something that's pretty interesting. If you don't see a score from last year, it's either because they were in a, they were in a grade where we don't really evaluate growth, so they may be kindergartners this year, they wouldn't have any growth, or um, they weren't tested with us. So there's also, um, you see a lot of, we get a lot of new students. And uh, she does some really great work with them. And you also, the state started this year. They changed the regulations, so they set progress targets for English language learners. So what you see in the second column is the progress target. And you see in the third column under 2019 what um, the student achieved. And in some cases, a student may not have met a progress target. So. There's a student that I randomly called N. A student didn't meet the progress target, but the student made a, a year's, I mean, excuse me, a, progressed a whole yeah, level. Progressed a whole level. Um, so we had some students who did not meet their progress target. Some students came very close. And we had many students who met or exceeded their progress targets. And our ESL teacher looks at these data, and it goes into factors in what we're doing programming for students in their schedule. How are progress targets determined? Because like I'm looking at student N, mm -hmm. you know, and in 2018 they were at 1.9, 2017 1.6, but somehow a progress target of 3.5 was assigned to them, and they got to 2.9, which shows me, you know, they yeah. moved up the whole yeah. level, but not two levels, or one and a half, which was kind of the expectation. Yeah. So I don't know the answer to that question. I don't know how they set these. Actually, you'd probably be better at answering it. I sent you the link. That would probably be better at understanding if I sent you the link, but I'm not sure how the progress targets are set. Yeah, it's just interesting um, when you have two prior years yeah. worth how they get to a 3.5. Anyway, I will look, and if I find a relevant link, I'll also share it out with the entire school committee. I am happy to do that research. I was just curious. Yeah, no, I'm yeah. curious now too, but I maybe probably be better at understanding. Maybe. <laughs> maybe not. <laughs> okay, thank you. Sure. And there's more data, right? Some good news. I love it when data makes it, indicates to us that some of our decisions 
made sense. So remember, Mr. Beck was all about opening up, eliminating barriers to AP. We want to take it, take it. We're going to try to, we want you to be successful, and opened it up. And now the students taking AP courses, which the state tracks as part of how well we're preparing students for post-secondary. And you can see that's just that steady increase, increase of students successfully completing the passing AP courses, which helped me a great deal on an early college grant application. Thank you, Hopkins students. Um, and their college enrollment, so we, um, now some of these percentages are hard because you're talking graduating classes of 35, 42, so percentages, um, you can't put as much in a percentage as if we had a 300 student class. Or uh, they fluctuate, you know, yeah. small changes create larger fluctuations in percentages with the smaller cohort. But we still see about, at the lowest, almost 8 out of 10 students who enroll in post-secondary um, after they graduate from Hopkins Academy. Um, what I do like to see is those students who are enrolling first to second year persistence means that they return. They don't exit college after freshman year, so they continue. That's what first to second year persistence is. And the obtaining first degree, these data always lag, so we really won't have, I can't answer right now how many students did it in four years, not because there's a lag on, the, on when they when the state captures the data. The state has to get it from those secondary institutions and they get back to us. Mm -hmm. um, but the good news is, again, um, there's that dip in the class of 2013, but um, you know, certainly class of 2012 and 2014. So we want students who pursue post-secondary opportunities. We want them to be successful. We don't want them to waste their time. And we certainly don't want them to waste their money or their parents. So we want them to complete. So it's good to see that we have a high percentage of completion in post-secondary. Our AP scores, this is informational and also be very, very careful because now talk about teeny tiny groups. I think the largest group was English, language, and comp, maybe world history, and we're talking about 14 kids. So really, we can take percentages right. But, um, because the percentages you're comparing to are much larger, the state of Massachusetts and globally. But I still think that there is great news that um, we had, you know, all of the students who took AP French scored a three or five. That's fantastic because you get college credit for that potentially. Um, we have our English language and composition. You can see if the blue bar is our mean score, which was over four, well above the state, and mass outperforms globally all the time in every part, Massachusetts always outperforms. And still, it was over four, and the, HA, the Massachusetts mean score was closer to three, and the global mean score was under three. So, great job, Miss Lanham, and all the students in that class. Excellent job. World History did a nice job of outperforming the Massachusetts mean score as well. So, our students are taking AP, and they're doing well placement courses, and that's what we'd like to see. And we're starting an additional AP course this year. We'll have AP economics available for students beginning this year. Great. So that covered the post-secondary yeah, readiness sorry. indicators for as well. All that, yes. Uh, no actions there. Any questions or comments? <coughs> A lot of great charts and information. Thank you, Amy. I know you did. <laughs> All right. I'm grateful for them. So there, they help with <laughs> interpretation. Okay, capital plan, Chris. Okay, um, I had it. Oh, there it is. <clears throat> so this is pretty close to what you guys saw last month. The one exception is the addition of the eleven thousand dollars on item number four, resurfacing and repainting Hadley parking lot. Yeah. Uh, or excuse me, Hopkins Academy parking lot. That is from to repave from the road on Middle Street to the edge of the parking lot. So the whole road that then takes the corner and goes down, it will replace all of that, um, which didn't really seem to be too bad of a price. That's great. Um, I met a couple weeks ago with Chris from the DPW, and he reached out to the vendor that the town um, has contracted with, and uh, it's the price we got. So. It's actually about 10700 and something, so um, figuring to throw an extra couple hundred dollars in certainly wouldn't hurt. If we don't use it, it just goes back to the town. Um, 
but those will be all of the items that you see on the um, <coughs> excuse me on the warrant for the fall town meeting. So the bus, I have a question here first. Yeah. But the tech upgrades, we already have those, so they won't be on STM. Or am I wrong? They won't be on the special town meeting warrant. That's an item where we we might need to decide if we want to defer that to spring town meeting. So this isn't part of the warrant article. Previously. No. Oh, okay. No. So that is part of like these two things to go together. Looking at the capital plan, and then you see that that next item about mm -hmm. what do we want to uh, the warrant the warrants are due nine four. Yep. So what do we want on the warrant? Mm -hmm. The tech upgrades. Those are all new. I met with David, and okay. uh, they're toward the bottom of the page, right after item number nine. Okay. Thanks. Uh, just gives exactly. details for that. Yep. And what's the timing of the um, parking lot? Like when would they, when do you think they do well, the, the problem is that we can't do it until the money is voted on. Right. That's October, so right. they were pretty quick to do the cracks in the parking lot. Um, so I would imagine, you know, they might be able to do it before it gets. A lot of it depends on weather, weather. but as long as it's not too cold, yeah, um, they could okay. probably do it before winter. Great. The bus replacement is replacing a 2006 bus, mm -hmm. so um, that's the beginning of getting us on the 10-year replacement schedule for the buses. Mm -hmm. um, we really don't want to wait for that, quite honestly. Um, if there, you know, if you look at the amount, it's a sizable amount for this year. We don't always have a request that big. There is the potential with the girls' locker room and the unit event replacement that MSBA could subsidize that and we would need less. This is the full amount, we don't know, we won't know. Right. Um, when is the? December, I think. Okay, yeah, so we won't know until after town meeting if we're going to get those funds. Um, so we ask for the full amount and we can always decrease it. Um, I'm in contact with the town treasurer often when it comes to these things, David or, um, either the, the treasurer or assistant treasurer will call me and just ask, when do you think we're going to start this? Because they don't want to borrow the funds now if we're not going to start it until July. Yeah. Um, so, you know, at that point I could say, well, you know, we're not going to start it until we hear from MSBA, let's wait, mm -hmm. and then we'll know exactly. I just saw this. I'm sorry. I just looked up and there's a, a one of those big heads yeah. um, <laughs> in the window. I thought it was somebody looking through the window. <laughs> it's actually for public comment. <laughs> it just took me by surprise. We I have haven't seen it. Here. We do. Um, so, so anyway, uh, that's where we stand. I'd like your take on the tech upgrades, just to see, you know, what you think about the timing of that. If it should be in the fall or, or moved off to the spring. Was there a take on the need for waiting versus? Um, just looking at the items here, I, I don't think it's something urgent, and to be honest, we had a lot of projects this summer, the new phone system, and David had a lot of things where I can check with him, but I really wonder if he's going to have the opportunity to get to some of these until later on anyway. Um, so, but, uh, I mean, I, I really don't see anything where, you know, we're desperate for it. Yeah. I can, I can double check with him. Do you have an idea of how many computers, uh, how many absolute computers that's replacing the 24,000? I didn't, uh, I didn't ask him a number, but I would guess uh, probably 48, you know, 48 to 50. Um, I'm guessing at this point in time they're around 500 bucks a piece. But the Chromebooks? Uh, no, the obsolete, obsolete computer obsolete. replacements 20. of $24,000. Yeah, I don't. We, we have them every two years uh, on his plan, so we'll kind of keep a rolling replacement until, I, I can't imagine we're actually going to replace them every two years once they've all been replaced, but, you know, um, until they are, he has it on that schedule. I think the key thing probably is, uh, as he frees up his workload, when does he want to get to this kind of stuff? Mm -hmm. uh, does he want to wait till April and then it essentially it goes into the following year, or give himself the opportunity to uh, start work on it earlier if his time frees up earlier. One question I have is um, I uh, was reviewing meeting minutes for um, a school committee meeting that I missed 
there was a presentation by Pam Hayward, um, and she indicated that some of her technology needs were around iPads. Um, is that included in here, or is that a separate component? Um, I don't think in, it was. Unless it's considered one of the obsolete computers. Um, I think they, if I recall correctly, there was a one-time purchase of iPads mm -hmm. at the very beginning of our technological implementation way back when. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure that there was another round of iPad purchases at that early grade level. So it, mm, I think that they, it was still being used by a small percentage of students rather than widely accessible. So. She also said she needed to do a fuller inventory of exactly what was out there, where it was, you know, and, what they needed and, and, and how old it was. Because right. I think until we understood that, we wouldn't know how to kind of, but I agree with you, to rotate out obsolete upgrade. Right. Yeah. And uh, if if her implementation of those things for the early childhood and, and, and special ed needs is delayed because we go into a spring uh, warrant, uh, just coordinating between the two would be good. Sure. Would we have time to be able to bring her back to the next meeting before them? No, our warrant articles are due September 4th, so I was going to throw out some possibilities and see how comfortable you are with those. I mean, one, I want to make sure I'm hearing you all correctly. So I think what I heard you say is that if, if Chris and David have a conversation about um, when he is actually going to get to these. And if it's based on the workload, which there is a lot with the safety grants, if he's not going to get to them until the spring, we'll be looking at annual town meeting for this. Also, check in with Pam Haywood mm -hmm. about what her needs are. It could be that her needs are something that we can do through support organizations and operating budget as well, too. Right. Um, or maybe so it's part of obsolete computer replacements. Or it's, it could be part Because it of is that. talking about replacing existing equipment. Right. Because she didn't talk about new technologies that were needed that I'm remembering. I believe she talked about like needing additional equipment for, for additional students, but I could be misremembered. Yeah, I, didn't, I didn't recall I didn't, that. I didn't see the like replace or update word in the minutes. Right. So I, I couldn't. But also, if I recall correctly, she was thinking of she was talking about trying to get the get get the funding from other organizations like help, like uh, public public yeah. So we will check with Pam. We'll check with David. So if I'm correct here, if David says nope, I'm ready to go, I'm going to tackle this work now. The school committee is saying these look like fine warrant articles. If he says no, nope, you can delay it. I'm going to get to it in the spring, then we bring it back for an annual town meeting. Yeah. And if he says he's good to go, you're comfortable with what these are, if not, we'll take them off. I think it's we'll take off tech. giving you that flexibility is, is good. If we can differ, uh, we should. But I guess uh, if, if uh, tech is deferred, then we would move forward with all the other items here under year one? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So if it's the really school is in agreement with that. I'm, I'm a little hesitant about deferring tech only because um, I, I think as a package, like I, I, I do want folks to see once. year one as a package. Yeah. The, the, where, where the priorities are, you know, some of it is maintenance, mm -hmm. some of so structural. Mm -hmm. Obviously, we want to upgrade um, the athletics, the girls' um, locker rooms. So there's there's an emphasis there, mm -hmm. but the technology is that's serving all students mm -hmm. and so I just I, I like the balance of including it I agree and they uh, the town did say stay on top of technology requests uh, do not let it get delayed again as we had many many years ago so uh, and, and these are not, not none of this is a, a new curveball it's all been openly discussed with right. town capital mm -hmm. folks so they're anticipating these requests for this year. Um, I, I like the idea of going once and not going on two different more articles. Definitely. And as I'm saying this, I'm realizing I believe that David and um, Christian had indicated to us that the town is trying to do capital at special town meeting and operating oh, great. at um, and 
due to the length of the meetings yeah. at the very minimum. <laughs> so we run really we'll long. We'll see. <laughs> so checking in with Pam, though, is there going to be enough time to get her needs met included in time? For well, time? it sounds like we're saying let's not leave it off. If we do it, let's do it all together. And if Pam's needs are in here, terrific. And if not, if not needs she, needs then it may need to be right. part of the obsolete computer. Right. So we may need and to that may need to adjust. Yeah. Right. Adjust in Readjust the future. Yes. Right. Exactly. Readjust how we allocate the money once it's voted. Right. Because once it's voted, we we can allocate the money. We can make adjustments to that. Mm -hmm. That could be that what she needs that we don't need that the part of the Right. And I, I want to confirm that I did see in the notes that she said uh, outside sources. So. Okay. Yeah. Good. Okay. The, the last thing in terms of our warrant article is, Chris, can you talk a little bit about the revolving count that has to be established? Oh, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so um, we have the Hadley Kids program coming in uh, essentially under the school umbrella. Mm -hmm. And as it stands right now, we have no account to put the money in. So we do need to create a revolving account to deposit um, the payments that are made. As it stands right now, they will go into the same park and rec account that um, they were currently placed in, and we will just track them, and then when we get the okay to open our account, we'll just make the transfer of everything over to ours. Um, you can't just put it in another account kind of as a placeholder until um, the account is opened. That would be nice, but it doesn't seem to work that way. Um, so we have to kind of leave it as it is. But that is something that we are going to have to request. That makes sense. So then I'm assuming kind of like when we see the whole town budget and accounts, that essentially that piece will be moving from park and rec into under the schools Correct. in the future. Yeah. OK. Yeah, I don't think you've seen it, actually. You've never seen it in park and rec because it's still the entity having kids existed until just like July 1 this fiscal year, um, right. so, um, but you will start seeing it once it's established, the revolving account reports that, that Chris does, you'll see it as a revolving account. Okay. Um, I know we moved off of capital, okay. but um, one thing I want to note is that it's a pretty sizable sum relative yeah. to other years, and um, having been a part of many town meetings, I think we should be prepared to come armed with a lot of information, but also um, possibly even visuals, maybe even a short video of, you know, this is what our girls' locker room looks like, photos, something that helps tell the story. Um, and I'm not sure about the unit replacement, but same kind of thing, if it's a, I can't recall if this was a legal requirement or not. Uh, How about the description? Most of these units are from the 1950s and 60s. Oh, right. Does that work? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and if they have to be replaced. So, uh, yeah, anything that might be scrutinized, uh, I would yeah. love for us to think in advance about how to sure. firm up our yeah. presentation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I had just written down before you said the biggest question for it. Prepare to answer all questions at right. special town meeting. But I wasn't thinking about visuals, because all I do is think about words and charts, so I'm glad that you said that. Visuals are helpful. Yeah, I, I personally have never walked through it, the, yeah. the girls' locker room, because I just have it. It's, you know, it's the girls' locker room, yeah. so. But maybe maybe we should, yeah. on a future meeting, just get a quick tour yes. of the girls' locker room and the boys' locker room, so we can actually see it ourselves yeah. and then be able to represent appropriately. Mm -hmm. Is it something maybe Eric could do with us to talk about that. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, also, like, I wouldn't know what to look at other right. than, you okay, know, yeah, this the looks old or the, the sink is running, yeah. but more, what are the kind, I mean, Eric Sevick may know more about And if we have it on the agenda, then yeah. I think that, you know, if anyone, <laughs> anyone out there who There's has a beef, anytime we get true. a bus or anytime we do this, they, you know, they're welcome to come along and see for themselves. I'll take pictures and, uh, and prepare something as well. Great. And we can, I'm making myself a note, I put in September meeting, we can 
put on the agenda that we can do a walkthrough and see if Jeff or Eric is available. Yeah. I wrote here a September meeting in the girls' locker room, which that won't happen. <laughs> <laughs> but let's not go that far. That, that would really hit home the message. Yeah, yeah, it would all be just how video awful it is. So. Yeah. 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 so we'll think about it, maybe. Okay. <laughs> Prove the point. All right. Great. Good idea. Thanks. Yeah. So it's capital and it's a revolving account and there's nothing else to my yeah. knowledge that the school committee wants to see on the warrants. It's like we have to submit those. Okay. No perfect. Okay, update SWAT due to the town. Yes, so the SWAT is due to the town on Wednesday. We talked about this in early August. Uh -huh. um, and I do want to Bring up, I did have a conversation with Pam Haywood. I know that she reached out to a couple folks on the school committee, and um, we can. This was me trying to capture a conversation. This SWAT is really about the school committee responding to a request from the select board, too. So, whatever you your recommendations are, but the it seems as though I may not have accurately captured the third bullet under weaknesses. And so I'm looking for input. I, I clearly didn't capture that as, as what we were trying to, to say about um, special education and um, yeah. So I'm looking for help. <laughs> Did Pam have any input? So in our conversation, um, she was, we both talked about that we want to be very careful about um, bringing up things that we haven't necessarily kind of evaluated with, with the data. But we also don't want to minimize, I mean, perceptions are just that, perceptions. Um, so we were thinking that it might make more sense to somehow have something that indicates that, you know, we need we need additional data and we need to analyze data around these topics so that we can determine the extent to which there's adequate programming that, um, and that we're meeting the expectations of parents of students with disabilities. So that our conversation was about framing it more as the, the weakness or the need is we need more data and we need to evaluate. And then um, even Pam had said perhaps when she comes back before the school committee, that we can look at some of that data and decide, okay, what what are the issues and what do we want to address? Is that specifically at Hopkins or was that throughout the district? Because the only reason I ask is because this one was specifying Hopkins. Yeah. yeah, and I think when Pam and I talked, we thought it was a worthwhile thing to do, obviously, to look at the entire district, yeah. like the extent to which do we have adequate resources, or do we feel as though students are included in meaningful ways in the general education curriculum and extracurricular activities. Um, yeah, so if that makes sense to you all, I would frame it as data collection and question, and then as we update this, if we identify issues, then those would go perhaps some strengths, perhaps some weaknesses, um, and it could be more specific. Is that, I agree. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Do you know whether, I mean, is the heart of this concern that it's not a priority or that the what we currently have may not, we may not be best equipped to handle, um, to best serve the students? Like, I because I read it, I, I wasn't totally sure whether it was, when you say could be more inclusive, that to me is, is kind of like, okay, are you, are you going to make this a priority or not? versus additional support needed, which might be you're understaffed or you're not prepared or I, I just wasn't sure how to read it. So these are my notes from our conversation. So this is the issue is with the note taker, I think really in all sincerity. So I'm open to any, if, if, I, if I captured something that wasn't even like brought up, I, I was furiously scrambling taking those notes. So I'm open to any input. I, I think it's actually important. So I, 
I, I, I think that Annie said it and that the weakness is that we don't really know, mm -hmm. right? right? We're not collecting any data, so how do we really know if there are any weaknesses to evaluate in the first place? Yeah. So I think yeah. that that the way the conversation is circled around, it really is a weakness of ours, maybe not the perception amongst many students with disabilities that we're not inclusive or whatnot, but that we're not able to definitively say that. Mm. Right. With the lack, of, lack of understanding. Right. So it's sort of a lack of... Well, evidence. Well, measurement. Yeah, it's, yeah. Yeah. So, so a question or answer. Right. A lack of mm -hmm. evidence that we're, are, are, I guess it sounds like, appropriately you know, serving the needs right. of all mm -hmm. students and um, however you want to frame the inclusive piece mm -hmm. too. Which is something we really include in our strategy document, making yeah. sure that we're inclusive, but we're not really able to give definitive measurement on that if we're doing it well or not. There's, yeah, there's a lack of quantifiable data around this. Um, a lot of, the, and it's a lot of um, anecdotal data, or uh, anecdotal evidence, when you think about the um, some of the open responses that we got to the, on, on the parent, the, 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 mm -hmm. the uh, the, the survey, the parent survey mm -hmm. yeah. um, and, and speaking with other parents and stuff, it's, it's, there's a lot of anecdotal data, but there's no way to quantify it, especially when, honestly, there's a lot of parents that don't want to publicly state sure. that. Yeah, so, which their feelings that aren't makes to sense. be minimized. Right. We, I don't think okay. that's the intention, but the intention is to really now take a look at that survey or take a look at the data based on a perception, maybe, maybe not there, maybe is there, and we'll right. be able to give something more. I, I think the way you're framing it is more, it, this is not a weakness because it is a characteristic of our district. It is a weakness that we don't have the, the measurable evidence to mm -hmm. determine whether or not we are, we have a problem or not. So that's, that makes sense. Which may change perception. It, exactly. Right. or may shine a spotlight on something that needs to be addressed. Mm -hmm. right. And even if the data indicates something that isn't a match for an individual parent's per uh, perception, I think Tara and I had this conversation at one point, I want to really want to be clear with parents that if your individual experience doesn't match what the data indicate about the system as a whole, that in no way minimizes the importance of individual experience. All that it does is help us to determine is this a gap that requires an institutional intervention or response? Mm -hmm. Do we need to reallocate resources? Do we need to do a large-scale intervention? Or have we, which we, we can do, and we try to avoid it and clean it up when it happens, have we dropped the ball in an individual case? And then how do we rectify that and fix it? So. All right. OK, I'll make that adjustment and then send this over to the town Wednesday. I know you weren't able to join us for that meeting, but I think we, we tried to reframe some of the things that were, I think, um, I don't know, framed in such a way that it almost sounded like these were problems that we couldn't do anything about. And I think we did a good job of just trying to reposition some of these things that are potential threats or weaknesses and obviously take advantage of the opportunities that, that come along with also um, uh, bringing in the Habit Kids uh, program. Yeah, the, the notes were pretty thorough, so thank you for uh, documenting some of the, like the SWOT analysis was very helpful. Um, and uh, there was another document that you shared. Um, I think it was going into the session, honestly. I thought that was really well done. Mm -hmm. um, but I, yeah, sorry to have missed it, but it sounds like it was um, very fruitful and helped direct the next year. And what was positive when we read the last slot, mm -hmm. Sumera and Heather were here, is how much many things have changed for the better. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Some of the things that were on there for people who are new sounded like, well, that's not true. Right. Right. So right. Well, it's like we addressed them. Like we, right. Right. we called them out as weaknesses before, and where we, we are, where we were able to say, hey, we've addressed this. Right. Or yeah. where we had opportunities, and now we see them as strengths because we took advantage of that opportunity. Right. That that was really right. gratifying. And we, it's in our mission, I know, is to take a continuous improvement mm -hmm. approach. And mm -hmm. so it's just, you know, we're moving on to the next level of possibility. Yep. Okay, um, and there's no action on that, is there? No. No. 
right. Uh, last one, Director of Curriculum Instruction and Assessment. So we have, we talked about this a little bit at uh, the retreat of um, how do we increase capacity in the district and grow leadership from within. We're a small district and we want to keep talented people around. Um, we want to give them opportunities to grow right here. So um, we have uh, a teacher at um, Hopkins Academy who's currently pursuing her, uh, her, her PhD and has um, done a lot of work at the school and in the district around curriculum instruction and assessment. And the schedule is such that we're able to decrease the person's teaching load, and then provide an opportunity to do some of this work in the district, which would provide um, wonderful support for our building administrators, for the district as a whole. So you can say, as you can see here, a lot of this would focus on, we don't have a district-wide curriculum council, so establishing schedules for the review and the revision of curriculum, the adoption of new high quality instructional materials, uh, helping us to move our positive behavioral intervention and supports and tiered systems of supports all the way up through eighth grade. So that vision is five years from now, K through eight, in reading, math, and social emotional learning. Students are universally screened three times a year. Students who need supplemental or intensive support are provided that support early on. We need progress monitoring the impact of our interventions. So helping us expand those efforts upward and throughout the system and downward in some cases. Um, assisting uh, with um, slightly, a teeny tiny bit around some of the Title I and Title III because it pertains to curriculum. Really focusing on uh, quality professional development, professional learning communities, PLCs for teachers, mentoring and induction. Um, so, that's what uh, this is designed to do. Recently, Granby Public Schools hired a full-time, they had a combined position, director of curriculum and um, technology. And uh, this is just focused on curriculum instruction assessment and, of course, the innovations that I've talked about, playing a key role in getting the innovation pathways up and running, early college up and running, and Chapter 74 approval for at least one program. And as of today, a three, two, undecided. So can you clarify um, how this impacts like headcount for FTEs? So FTEs, what it would be is the person in this um, in this case, teaching 0.57, admin 0.43, um, and no impact um, to the operating budget because of the cost of some of our new hires and some of the changes that we've seen in staffing, some retirements and changes in staffing. Um, so no impact in FY20 in terms of headcount, assuming that our um, headcount, we don't have our October 1 count yet, let's say we're roughly the same mm -hmm. as last year, your ratio spread across all your students would then increase in that. Um, now, in terms of this, the, this position with, um, that fits nicely with the need that we have and with the with faculty that, that we have, um, as faculties change over and things like that, um, what would be what what would be like the end of life on this position, or like would that be would, would if that that teacher moves on or whatnot? Is there like now this other gap that we would be looking to fill? In? So work? I think every time that happens, I would, I would bring it to the school committee. So um, when, um, so for example, we had our um, the person who had previously been our math coach that had the elementary school has decided to completely retire. It was a retired teacher, and what we found is that given some of our class sizes that had the elementary and how our special schedule worked, that one of our special teachers was very interested in doing math coaching. 
And our specialist teacher also is certified in the content area of mathematics, which is quite a win, right? It makes the person uniquely qualified. It's unusual to have elementary teachers who are content certified in math, which they won't in elementary cert. And um, so that was a tremendous win-win. We're going to test out the schedule of a highly qualified person who's seeking this opportunity, knows all of the students, and allows us to then, when I talked about no impact to the budget, kind of we're going to test this out and say, do we need to rehire exactly as we had before, or do we have some capacity in-house to do the work as well as we were doing it, and maybe in different kind of new ways of doing it. Um, so every time, if, if the person in the position were to move on, we always do, I hit the pause button and say, okay, what do the data demonstrate about what we need now? And what makes the most sense? Rather than immediately just um, filling the position. Um, similarly, uh, we talked about at our retreat that our nurse leader, for very personal reasons, has, um, has decided at this point to step away from the workforce. And um, that's another place and so much of that work was wrapped around the grant that we no longer have. Rather than immediately posting, it makes sense. I've, I've spoken with um, our nurses and our newly hired nurse, our nurse here and our newly hired nurse, and said, what I'd really like to do is make sure I check in with you folks at least twice a week face to face. And I want you to tell me what issues came up that would have required administrative leadership that you feel like you didn't have so we can make a really informed decision about what we need to do with that FTE. So it could be that in FY21 to your original question about what happens to the headcount, that it, it might be neutral, right, right. depending on what we do with other positions. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I wouldn't just immediately yeah. fill it. But but currently, this is not a new full-time role. We're no, it's not a new full-time yeah. role. It's, and it's something that somebody who's we have kind of an immediate uh, interest in potential yeah. uh, we, current employee yeah. who would be able to fill this role and perform their current duties. Yeah, so we have a need and an interest, and I also um, feel like, uh, you know, I, I want to do what I can to, I tell people all the time, if you're interested in making different uh, contributions, if you're interested in growing in leadership, or even if you're just interested in trying new innovations in your classroom or in your role, come and see me. I mean, our, we want to recruit talent and we want to retain it. So this is also part of an effort to do that. Mm -hmm. with, the create, with the creation of this role, is it something that can be posted internally? Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, having this kind of asset in house across the two schools is such a valuable thing because it's it's no one's full-time responsibility to be looking at the curriculum and day to day you know you get the prep and then you get some PD time but who's really looking at it constantly and working with the educators to design across disciplines new curricular opportunities and new professional development opportunities I think this is a great new asset to explore and uh, and, and try out So this one is an action item for the to acceptance of this uh, Director of Curriculum Instruction Assessment job description. Are there any other questions on this or concerns, clarifications needed? I have one more question, yeah. sorry. As far as kind of, so have we been completely, we haven't been completely neglectful over all these areas. Who's kind of been responsible? Has it been divided amongst? Is it... So in some of these where you say assist principals with, um, so the idea of a, a school instructional calendar is adding all of these, you know, what we do day to day is when, so people can see the whole picture. Um, but when you say assist principals with, then it kind of indicates to you that the principals have been solely responsible mm -hmm. um, for that, and uh, or assist superintendent with, the superintendent's mm -hmm. been solely responsible for that. And, right. um, and as, if this were a position that district need that you know required more time or somebody grew into and um, it worked in terms of teaching load and the needs of Hopkins, those assists then 
turn into this is your responsibility mm -hmm. primarily. Mm -hmm. Well, that was kind of my next question yeah. too. Was is this work at 0.57 FTEs attainable? Well, it's 0.43, and that's where that word sorry. assist is. So it's mm -hmm. even less. Is that if it were a full time position, say it's the job of this individual, mm -hmm. but it's and also in as people learn. I mean, we have very talented people in house, but it's also about learning too. Mm -hmm. So the people who've been primarily responsible are all the people that are being assisted. <laughs> <laughs> I only have one other question, yeah. and that is, um, I'm trying to imagine how a curriculum designer um, would require constant bending, twisting, lifting, pushing. <laughs> yeah, that, 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 you you can should talk to around. your school counsel, Fred Dupre. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Cover all bases? Everybody. And every kind of physical motion. Every role requires yes. constant bending. Yes. Got it. That's, yes. There could be some big boxes of old curriculum back. I guess. <laughs> that is true. I think it would be good, though, as part of this, to have kind of a commitment, maybe at the end of this mm -hmm. upcoming academic year, to also hear not only from you but um, from other administration sure. as to how this role is benefiting them. Because Definitely. obviously they're assisting, but the goal is that by assisting, they're going to free up, you know, other responsibilities for you know what Brian to take on. Right? <coughs> So. Perhaps a, a joint presentation a year from now. Yep. Yeah. And the individual who's in that role too to make sure that Absolutely. it is not impacting their ability to teach or vice versa or whatever, yeah. that they feel balanced. The nice thing about having a teacher in the role is also your administrator full time, although I try very hard to remember to volunteer and offer to work with students, but you just forget how these things play out in the day to day life of a teacher. They're not living that reality. Mm -hmm. It's nice when someone's living that reality so they can say, well, this is about the stupidest plan you ever hatched up. Mm -hmm. But I'm sure they'd say it much nicer than that. All right. Um, that concludes all of our presentations yeah. and discussion items. Personnel report is next. Yes. So I'm I still oh, need to motion that. Oh, you, you did. did. Oh, did. We I'm did. sorry. We started yeah. and we didn't finish. That's right. Um, is there a motion to accept the job description of the Director of Curriculum Instruction and Assessment? So, second. Are you all in favor? Aye. Thank you. <coughs> okay, okay. personnel. Yes, our nurse leader has um, fully and, and retired now. Um, Kirsten, um, she, our nurse at Hadley Elementary School, was and she was very clear that she was very very sad to leave us but she had a great opportunity so she gets to work in the school where her children attend which is really nice for her um, and we do have somebody offered and accepted the position today a certified and qualified school nurse with a decade of experience including experience in um, therapeutic residential special education settings Great range of experience. She will start for us on September 9th. And we have a new music teacher and um, some new ESPs. And you can also see we filled other positions. So we only right now, which it doesn't show here, um, so we filled the nurse. We're still looking for that 0.4 educational team leader. And we found out today we have one ESP opening at Hopkins Academy. We were notified today. Other than that, Fully Ready to go. Yeah. Just in Wednesday. Know, yeah. All right. All right. Public comment. There's a go guy ahead. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> comment. I can't even tell who that is, but. And nobody's happy. He's got a big smile on his face. We only yeah. have happy people in school. It's <clears throat> a happy place. Perfect. Okay. Business manager report. Chris. Okay. So. I have nothing. Uh, <laughs> no expenses. Uh, no. Um, I need to add several new accounts that we've opened this year, and I've been in contact with VADAR several times to add these accounts to the access database report that uh, comes out of there, and even this afternoon I was speaking with him and he said, all right, I'm going to have to call you back and take a look at it, and um, I, I didn't get a call back, so at 4.30 I called him back and there was nobody in the office. Um, so I, 
I did run the report, but unfortunately, um, you know, missing several accounts, it's best not to give one at all than to give one missing uh, part of the budget. Um, I mean, it, there's not a lot of expenses anyway. We, we, you know, we, we've had um, a month and a half worth of expenses in there, so it's not a huge amount, but it'll certainly be rectified by next, uh, next meeting. Uh, grant report, we really have no grants yet um, for FY20. Um, I did apply for that one today, by the way, with the one you mentioned. So, um, I just want to clarify, because they're probably thinking, wait a minute, she told us we have grants. We have grants. And then Chris, once they're approved or we get them, Chris uploads them into the system called Ed Grants. So they, once they get uploaded, then you start getting reports. So we could have approval, but we just haven't, we haven't put it in the system yet. Right. Until we get the approval through the system, we can't get any money from them. So okay. since we can't get any money from them, we're not charging anything to them either. So. Um, revolving accounts, I actually ran that report today, but the town has not rolled over uh, the funds for FY19 to 20. So there's been no revenues yet posted in 20, um, and they all started with a zero balance, which um, even in the lunch account, the zero balance is not good at this point in time because it should be a positive balance. So, um, But uh, again, you know, until they roll that over, which I'm assuming it should be any time <coughs> soon, um, I, I really can't you know, report on it. Uh, and the capital plan, of course, we already looked at. So. My apologies that some of these just didn't work out with, with the timing, but um, they were kind of uh, out of my control. So, next month. Thank you. Okay, school committee reports and discussion. The policy group, you guys are going to be meeting? We're going to yeah, be meeting. either before or after. We'll do the policy book in much smaller chunks and commit to before or after school committee. So, we'll get that sorted of for September. So, that's a plan. Me too. Okay, finance tri board. I have no updates. I heard fields. I know Paul's not here, but do we have an update on that? So we've um, all issues around land ownership have been resolved. We did receive an email today from the butter expressing again um, an issue that they have with a piece of the plan. So uh, Chris and I are going to get together to take a look at that and talk with Paul a bit about his thoughts on that and then make some determinations about how to proceed. But the major things, the land is resolved. We are, we can, the land is resolved. The plan would be in September. Conservation Committee, they were withholding their vote until the land issue was resolved. And that would put us in a position to um, now Kind of break ground in the spring. And I talked to Eric today, Eric Sutnick, and he said, even though it's taken a long time, in some ways it's a blessing in disguise because if we've been up and running this summer, he's going to have to, he would prefer that after we've gone up to bid and awarded it to a builder, he would prefer to sit with the, the, the contractor and be very clear about how much field to be available when, because he's going to have to redo the entire practice schedule. And it's not just like what's on the, I mean, as you said, there'll be a fence, and we probably just stay back from the fence, so it would really be better for me to have plenty of time to see how much of our practice schedule we have to move around the council. <coughs> okay, great. That's good news. Collaborative from Mara, you've sent some things. Yes, I have. So uh, you saw that there's a, um, another a school committee um, training, charting the course. Um, which we all had to take when we first joined. Heather, I'm glad to see that you're going to be taking that in September. That's pretty great that they're bringing it to our community, which is, in the past, we've, I've had to travel as far as, I think it was Lee or Lennox mm -hmm. or something way yeah. out there. Um, they um, have a long hiatus from the June meeting to the September meeting, so there isn't much to report. There was a, an executive director's report that I circulated with you all today. Um, one thing that I find interesting is a program that they were, um, that I've, I've seen them uh, uh, talk about this before, but this is the Diverse Teacher Workforce Coalition of Western Massachusetts. So they're involved with districts to um, increase the number of licensed black and Latina educators in Western Massachusetts and in our quest to have our um, schools be um, diverse and reflective of the students that we're serving. It might um, be worthwhile to look at what the 
uh, program entails and see whether it's right for us. Right. As we're talking about CES, I wanted to, I, I have spoken with Superintendent John Robert. We had a discussion about Hatfield and Hadley, the school committees coming together. And there's been a wholesale change in the school committee composition up in Hatfield. And as John and I were talking, um, it seems like it might make sense, and I mentioned this last year to build a deal before the executive director at CES, and I'm going to follow up with him again, that it might make sense not to just limit this conversation to Hadley and Hatfield, but really to see if Phil can, through the representatives that could then bring it back to the school committee, but maybe create, um, invite more people into the conversation about what are some of the issues that we face as a result of declining enrollment, and what are some innovative solutions to staying viable and not limiting that conversation. So I'm going to look to build the deal to kind of open it up, Great. see which districts are interested in being in the conversation, because there could be other districts like Mohawk that have great ideas about, and can share some other ideas with us. Great. Sounds good. And I did get back to Bill. He was asking just for a little more context around um, the question that we had, and I did get back to him directly about uh, you know, precautions that, that, that Hatfield was taking as um, the population gets smaller and smaller mm -hmm. and declining in moments and what they've learned from research and what, you know, what planning is in place. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I think he's got at least that framing. All right, uh, let's see, we have a couple other action items we need to address. The uh, 8C, approval of non-union employee handbook. That is a mistake. I should have put that on adjustments. That goes to September. Okay, got it. Justin. Approval of the August 5th, 2019 minutes. Are there any questions or comments on those minutes? No, that's good. Is there a motion to approve? Move to approve the August 5th minutes. Second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. We did E. Okay, waiver of building use fees. Yes. So it, after the fact, full we'll disclosure. <laughs> yeah. do after the fact. So I uh, saw there last to week. public safety <laughs> that they did not have to pay a building, but by policy, school committee can only approve the waiver of that. Given the fact that our public safety officials are teaching a course at Hopkins Academy, uh, doesn't have a blood drive. That's your payment. <laughs> <laughs> do you get in the? Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> uh, motion to approve. The building exactly. the All in favor. Aye. 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 Okay, and then the acceptance of the donation of the Hadley Elementary School for Yes, thank you, thank you the to the Divine family for giving us a new door. Um, so this is uh, really much appreciated. Jeff Mish mentioned it to the Divine family in passing and they very generously donated the overhead door and installation. Wonderful. Thank you to the Divine Family and Divine Overhead Doors. Absolutely. So we need to vote on that motion to approve the donation from the Divine Family. Yep. Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Great. Okay. Next regular meeting date. So we would typically be meeting September 23rd. Are there any um, conflicts with meeting on the 23rd? Mm -hmm. Not on my part. Mm -hmm. There's a soccer game here. That's it. Okay, then we'll plan on uh, Monday the 23rd. Does it make sense to just quickly glance forward and look at yeah. October? Okay. Sure. In, uh, in yeah, so October, our meeting would be the 28th. Right. Is that right? Yep. Currently, that works for me. Yep, me too. October 28th. Yep. Okay. November. 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 So November gets, might get a little tricky for right. me after Thanksgiving and um, something I may have to do for my sister. So if it's possible, can we check on November in September? Oh no. Is that okay? Because uh, right yes. on 4th is, is the 4th the... Well, the, the fourth week is the twenty-fifth. It, it is. The, I guess that would be the week of Thanksgiving, right? Is, is Thanksgiving so week, the twenty-first or twenty-eighth so this year? Fourth Thursday, so it's the twenty-eighth, right? Is that right? Twenty-eighth or twenty-ninth, I think. Yeah. 
Uh, sorry, 28th is the Thanksgiving break. And 28th is Thanksgiving. Yeah. I probably won't be here for November either. For that week. I mean, that week might be a problem for everyone. I probably won't be here for the November meeting, period. Yeah. So not even if it's on the 18th. That's the 25th, yeah. Oh. Is that <laughs> you get 10 days. <laughs> so do we want to look at the week of the 18th, the week prior? So can I check? Is oh, it, I'll check yes. with my sister and then before we don't have to wait till September, I can send out an email and we can announce and I can move uh, Paul to that also. Yeah. Okay. In general, I would say I would be in favor of moving it a week earlier, even if you weren't traveling, yeah. because it is a busy vacation yeah. week. and. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I wouldn't, wouldn't mind keeping that clear. Okay. And if we needed to push it later, the following week, even if we have it like on a Tuesday or not, not a Monday right after the holiday weekend, that that week is fairly open. On the second, yes. Later yeah, later yeah later so later, later that like the third. The second, for instance. Third might. Uh, yep, second works. Yeah. Good, so we got September and October confirmed, and we we'll might check there and I'll work everybody with the 18th. Yep. All right. Good. I think, uh, is there a motion to adjourn the meeting? Motion to adjourn the meeting. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye.